Well, hello to you and welcome to this continuing professional development presentation on obesity prevention and control, the healthy communities approach. My name is Brian Mangum. I'm a consultant epidemiologist and I'm also an assistant professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at Fiji National University and an assistant professor of public health at the College of Micronesia FSM where I am fortunate enough to be a seconded for the next three years working on exciting projects like this to bring uh, continuous professional development coursework to members of the uh, public health workforce, the medical workforce, the nursing workforce across, well, really all of the uh, Pacific, but in particular across the USAPI, which is the United States Affiliated Pacific Islands. So that includes uh, Guam, uh, CNMI, RMI, Palau, um, FSM, as well as American Samoa. But of course, these presentations are for anyone working in uh, public health in the Pacific, as well as really anyone working in uh, public health anywhere that happens to come across them. So I hope that you enjoy them. So today we're going to be talking, like I mentioned already, about obesity prevention and control. And we're going to, in particular, be talking about how do we go about partnering with communities to develop a, a policy systems and environment approach to healthy communities that result in obesity resilient communities. And I do want to mention really quick that this lecture is based largely upon some open source material that I was able to receive from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I'm very appreciative of that. But I have added my own little mixture of things in here, so it should never be assumed that anything I present today represents the official view of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Now, many of you that are watching this presumably know who I am, but there's just a little bit of background on me. I am a consultant epidemiologist. I am an assistant uh, professor in a variety of different roles that I've mentioned already. I've been involved in public health and epidemiology and uh, medical anthropology and a variety of different things for quite a while. I've been, it's 2015 if you're, if you're hearing this presentation, and I've been here in the Pacific since a about, oh, about the last three and a half years or so. I do love the Pacific. I do plan on making it my home for quite a while. But then again, I have spent my uh, entire professional career on islands. I started out in the Caribbean and Latin America and then eventually made my way over here to the Pacific. And so in many ways, uh, I consider the islands my home. And so you can just see a little bit more about me and some of the things that I've done there in the past. I do just want to briefly mention what's going to happen in the next couple of slides here. Uh, the next slide has a, uh, a presentation overview, so we're going to talk about, you know, what are we going to cover today, and we'll talk a little bit more about an overview of the obesity epidemic. Much of the information that I'm going to present statistically, at least in the uh, first portion of the slides, deals with the mainland United States, and I apologize for that, but I don't have a whole lot of statistics for a lot of areas out here in the Pacific, uh, especially since I have such a wide-ranging audience across the Pacific here. So I didn't want to single out any one particular jurisdiction. So I have some stats uh, from the mainland United States, and there's actually a map that uh, shows a progression of the obesity epidemic in the United States and what it's going to show. And it's going to flow kind of automatically. That's why I'm introducing it now. What it's going to show is it's going to show the different states on the mainland as well as Hawaii and Alaska. And they're going to be represented in different colors. And what you're going to see is that the colors are going to progress towards uh, they're going to start out with blue and they're going to progress towards a dark red. And as they progress towards dark red, what it represents is it represents the percentage of the population in those states that are increasingly obese. And so over a period of about 10 years, you're going to see how rapidly the uh, mainland United States, as well as Alaska and Hawaii, developed high, high rates of obesity. Now, once again, I just give it to you for information's sake. But what you'll also recall, if you've listened to some of my other presentations, is that here in the Pacific, or what I like to call the Blue Continent, we have a very, very low population, uh, but yet we cover an immense range of uh, geography out here. We also happen to be some of the unhealthiest places in the world. Okay, We bear the largest burden of some of the chronic diseases in the world. In particular, we are the fattest region in the world. 
Some of our islands have upwards of 90 plus percent of their population that are obese. All right. So along with that, because really obesity is the epicenter of the NCD pandemic that we're experience uh, that we're experiencing, and because obesity is the uh, uh, the major problem that we face here in the Pacific, it's not surprising that we also have some of the highest rates of um, type two diabetes. All right, here in the Federated States of Micronesia, uh, we used to be the number one when the International Diabetes Federation ranked uh, nation states with diabetes. Federated States of Micronesia was number one. We did fall to number three last year, but that still puts us significantly high up there. Um, we have some of the highest rates of cancer. We have some of the highest rates of cardiovascular disease and stroke. And one thing you've probably also heard me talk about based upon a study I did with the World Health Organization is that along with our high rates of chronic disease, we also have some of the highest rates of non-communicable disease associated disability. So that would be diabetic retinopathy, that would be um, uh, uh, mental impairments associated with stroke, that would be amputees that need wheelchairs, and so on and so forth. But we also have some of the lowest uh, capacity in terms of our ability to deal with that, with rehab, with being able to provide artificial limbs, and so on and so forth. So we are definitely a region that is in crisis. We are being overwhelmed with obesity and all of the associated problems that come along with it. Okay. So um, in the second half of the presentation, we'll talk a little bit, and then we'll go through how did we get here. We'll talk about increased consumption of uh, sugar-sweetened beverages. I do recommend you go and you watch my presentation on economic and nutritional shifting, the global roots of the NCD pandemic because that talks a little bit about New World Syndrome and some of the large-scale economic factors that have resulted in the high rates of obesity and NCDs here in the Pacific Islands. But we'll talk just a little bit more about that in brief. Then we'll talk about why should local governments care, because one of the real big take-home messages that I want you to get out of this lecture is I want you to focus on what we call the policy, systems, and environment approach okay, to public health. And what the policy systems and environment approach, or what I sometimes like to refer to as the public revolution, focuses on is this idea of how does government, and when I say government, I just I don't just mean the Ministry of Health and the Department of Public Health and the hospital and so on and so forth. I mean all sectors of government, the Department of Education, the, uh, you know, the economic development agencies, and I mean other sectors of the economy as well, the NGO sector as well as the private economic, financial, uh, educational sectors. How is it that we go about developing policies at all levels? And WHO refers to this approach as health in all policies. How do we go about developing policies that when we make a policy um, that impacts the banking sector, how do we ensure that that also has a positive impact on the ability of our populations to be economically self-sufficient so that they can afford to go out and buy the appropriate fruits and vegetables? How do we have government develop policies that ensures that we have open green space and we have walking paths and we have areas that... Um, that influence the population to make positive health choices. All right, so we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about the policy and environmental changes that are needed to address obesity. And then in the final chunk of the presentation, we'll talk about the CDC recommended community strategies and measurements to prevent obesity. Now, some of these will be more applicable to the Pacific Islands because we have to admit that we are different out here. You know, we're not even Honolulu. I mean, we're not even, you know, uh, the large city in Hawaii. We're a world in and of ourselves out here. So some of the CDC recommended community strategies will be very applicable to us and some of them will be less applicable to us. But I do want you to keep in mind that we are an economically, we're a politically and we're a socially developing region of the world. So as we develop economically and we see increased urbanization, which is something you know that I've talked about in other lectures, we're going to see that a lot of the problems that are being faced by larger areas such as China, Australia, uh, the United States, states and so on and so forth are going to be problems for us here in the Pacific as well. We've seen this in Fiji, which is where I call, call home. We've definitely seen the impact of urbanization and the epidemiological transition there and many of the problems that are being faced in Fiji, even though it's a South Pacific island nation, are similar to those that are being faced by areas like the United States, uh, Western Europe, and uh, Hawaii and so on and so forth. Okay. 
So what's going to happen now is I'm going to click the slide and it'll give a quick overview of the uh, five areas of the presentation and then it's going to go automatically into playing that map of the United States that illustrates the uh, changes in obesity levels. And then once that cycles through and you can see the impact of that and it really is rather devastating, we'll get into a, an overview of the obesity epidemic and talking about how we got to this point. So there's that overview I mentioned, and we'll move right along in just a second. And so you can see what's happening there. The percentage of the population with a BMI of greater than 30, or a 30 pounds overweight for an average uh, U.S. adult, is slowly increasing. And we're seeing fewer and fewer states, those in light blue, that have BMIs in their population. And by look, by about 2001, only Colorado, 2002, no states had less than that. And we were starting to see uh, those states in red, particularly in the southeastern United States, where they have high rates of poverty, low education levels, and some of those common socioeconomic indicators that we associate with non-communicable diseases uh, increasing. And then if you look, by the time we get here to 2007, what do you see? Well, only Colorado uh, actually is a state that has a population with 15 to 19 percent of the population uh, with a BMI of less than uh, 30 there. Okay, And like I said, if you get into those other populations, uh, spe especially into the uh, southeastern United States, you can see that we have very, very high rates of obesity. And, and of course, we would have high rates of NCDs associated with those. And even look at this, by 2007, Hawaii, which which is probably the closest thing that we see here on the map uh, to populations similar to the Pacific, although native Alaskans would be uh, similar as well in terms of their economics and so on and so forth. Even Hawaii has a 20 to 24 percent of the population, and uh, even Alaska has 25 to 29 percent. So let's jump ahead with a slide here. Okay, so 2008, we're seeing the po the uh, uh, the states with the populations where we have greater than 30% of BMI above 30 are increasing, especially in the southeast. And then uh, the, the 2009, which is the most recent year for which really good data is available. Still, only Colorado is a state that has 15 to 19 percent of the population, but that's still quite significant, whereas the, the bulk of the rest of the United States has somewhere between 20 and 29 percent, and even uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 states, okay, moving up into the northeastern United States as well, have populations with grady, greater than 30 percent of their population have a BMI of over than 30 over 30 percent. So obviously this is a significant risk factor for the mainland United States and we would see similar trends out here in the Pacific. In fact we would probably see even higher trends especially when you look at some of the island nations like Tonga and Samoa where we see 80 to 90 percent of the population is tragically fitting into the obese category. Now many of you who know me uh, to use the uh, the Fijian word, you know, I'm a Palangi, or if I was using uh, the Hawaiian word, you know, I'm a Haole, uh, and, and I always apologize a little bit for that, because I want it to be well known that if I'm picking on the Pacific, it's not because I'm shaking my finger like I'm an outsider and saying, oh, naughty, naughty Pacific, how bad of you. I want you to understand that if I'm, if I'm presenting negative facts about the Pacific, and if I'm, you know, advocating for change in the Pacific, it's because this is my home too now. You know, I'm raised four kids here. My wife and I both work here, and like I mentioned before, we're making our home here. And so I want it understood that I'm, I'm about change. I'm about advocating for a healthier Pacific and a return for those traditional values that had traditionally made the Pacific people a strong people, a people that were, you know, navigating by the ocean currents while my ancestors were stuck in the bubonic plague in uh, Europe. Okay, so please do understand that I'm not trying to pick on the Pacific. I'm just trying to present some of the, uh, the facts as how they stand. So a couple of statistics here. Um, if you've been in public health very long, you already know these things. Okay. So between 1998 and 2000, as we've seen graphically represented in some of those slides, the obesity prevalence among U.S. adults uh, doubled. All right. And recent data indicates an estimated 34% of adults are obese in the United States. That's a huge number. And like I said, tragically, it's even worse out here in the Pacific Islands. Okay. 
More than one in six U.S. children is obese, three times the rate as the 1970s, okay? That's a significant problem because you understand that an obese child becomes an obese adult. And many of the, uh, the health consequences of obesity are now being seen in children, and that's carrying on into adulthood. You know, we've since... Um, and since the late 1800s, if you look at the top achievements in public health, um, many of them have resulted in an increased expected lifespan uh, for both males and females. Well, we're actually getting to the point, and in particular as it's associated with obesity and obesity in children and all those negative health consequences like cardiovascular disease, where we expect that uh, several generations down the road and possibly even you know, my children and my children's children will live shorter lives than I did. And it's strictly, it's it's firmly associated with obesity and the problems that we see with that. So it's a significant health concern, all right? Now, according to 2006 to 2008 self-reported data, what do we see? Um, African Americans or blacks have 51% higher prevalence of obesity, and Hispanics had a 21% higher obesity prevalence when compared with Caucasians. And like I said, tragically, and if you've seen some of my other presentations where I talk about social determinants of health, poverty uh, disproportionately impacts people uh, uh, people who have lower socioeconomic status, and in particular, people of diverse economic backgrounds because they can't access uh, in many ways the necessary resources to allow them to live healthier lives, to live in uh, communities that are free of um, uh, free of pollution, uh, have access to clean water and uh, access to quality foods. And so it does disproportionately impact certain ethnic groups and certainly we see that here in the Pacific as well. All right, so we talked about a quick little overview of the obesity epidemic there. So now let's talk briefly about how did we get to this point in terms of obesity. And like I said, go back and watch my presentation on economic and nutritional shifting because it goes about an hour and a half into depth talking about uh, the impacts of urbanization and uh, so on and so forth. So we'll only talk about this briefly in this presentation. You know, I do want to mention overall there are a variety of factors that play a role in obesity, and this makes it a complex, uh, very complex health issue in terms of us addressing it, and that's uh, even more so here in the Pacific. Now, overweight and obesity, as you know, results from an energy imbalance which involves eating too many calories and not getting enough physical activity. And so in clinical practice, you'll have people say, well, you know, can't you give me a pill, doc, to help me lose weight? What's the magic pill? Well, tragically, the magic pill is oftentimes eat less and move more, but it's really not as simple as that, all right? As you already know, a lot of people live in an environment where it's just not possible for them to uh, uh, eat healthier food because of economic uh, restrictions that they might have. And a lot of times it's difficult for them to move more. Maybe they're working multiple jobs to provide for their family. Maybe they live in a physical environment in which uh, there are not opportunities for physical recreation. All right. Um, here on the island of Pompeii, I noticed that, and it's a beautiful island full of wonderful people, and I love it here. But one of the things I notice is that we don't always have enough um, open space for people to become physically active in. And so what I notice when I drive around as I notice that if there's any open space, an empty lot, people are out there and they're using it to get physical activity. So once again, that's part of that policy systems and environment approach in which we uh, call upon government, we call upon policymakers, and we become advocates from the public health standpoint to get them to address the need for populations to have access to physical open spaces where they can engage in activities. And it isn't just government. You know, we want to partner with churches. We want to partner with community groups. We want to partner with ethnic organizations because they can all become partners in providing programs to help kids and teens become physically fit. I know that here on the island of Pompeii, one of the outlying churches has a wonderful billboard up where they talk about how they sponsor basketball teams to help kids be physically active. Okay, So that's just kind of a little bit more information on, you know, it isn't just strictly dietary behaviors that have gotten us to this point. But in this section, we're going to describe how um, individual behaviors and in particular uh, dietary behaviors, as well as our environment, contribute to the obesity epidemic.
Okay, so dietary behaviors and individual choice, even if uh, that individual choice is restricted by socioeconomic and psychological factors, do play a role in terms of the obesity uh, epidemic. And a couple of them I want to single out here are in particular the consumption of what we call sugar-sweetened beverages, or SSBs, as well as continued low consumption of fruits and veg vegetables. Now, sugar-sweetened beverages are the largest source of added sugar and an important contributor of calories in the uh, diet here in the Pacific as uh, well as in all other developed and uh, developing areas of the world. Now high consumption of uh, sugar sweetened beverages has been associated with obesity. No surprise there. A lot of the longitudinal studies which have been very well done um, have shown an association between sugar sweetened beverages and various measures of increased body fat as well. Um, in Fiji, and once again, I'm not trying to pick on Fiji, we do see a lot of times that um, kids will, for breakfast, they'll consume a, uh, a loaf of white bread and they'll consume an, an orange soda, all right? Now, in terms of health literacy, uh, a lot of times people don't understand that just because it, it's orange doesn't mean that it's a fruit juice, all right? They think because it's orange, it might be healthier. So that goes back to our role as health educators and public health practitioners about trying to increase the basic health literacy of the populations which we serve so that they can make better choices. Now, sugar-sweetened beverages, kind of going off of what I'm just saying here, uh, tend to have few, if any, nutrients. Okay, Now, when we talk about sugar-sweetened beverages, we're talking about soft drinks, so it would be soda, uh, or sometimes referred to as pop, depending on where you're in the world. Um, fruit drinks, a lot of your fruit drinks that you get off the shelf are not 100% fruit juice, but they have been... Uh, uh, they've been turned into sugar-sweetened beverages. Sports drinks are an important source of this as well. We tend to think of them as healthy, but in fact they tend to contain high amounts of sugar. And when we take uh, tea and coffee and we add sugar to them, they become unhealthy, and this can be sweetened milk or milk alternatives, and really any other beverage to which sugar typically in the form of high fructose corn syrup or uh, sucrose or even cane sugar, although cane sugar is better for you than high fructose corn syrup, but any time that uh, one of those has been added, then we're dealing with a sugar-sweetened beverage. And we know that we have high, high increased rates of uh, consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages here in the Pacific Islands. Now, fruits and vegetables, as you know, are part of a healthy diet, and they are important especially for optimal childhood growth, as well as optimal weight management and chronic disease prevention. But we also know that fewer than 1 in 10 American adolescents and adults consumes the recommended amounts of fruits and vegetables on a daily basis. And I do want to mention here, and you know this because you live here in the Pacific with me, is just because we're, uh, you know, uh, tropical islands and beautiful bays and uh, crystal clear blue waters and beautiful sunsets it doesn't always mean that we have adequate access to fruits and vegetables. Now, many of us live on islands that uh, depend upon outside imports of fruits and vegetables that either come from Hawaii, the mainland, or even in some instances uh, from Australia and possibly even from China. Now, because we're bringing these in as imported, generally what it means is that we're paying higher prices for things, okay? Which, once again, sometimes has the capacity to price individuals out of the ability to uh, access these and to consume enough of them in their diet. Now, we also have increased frequency of meals that are being eaten away from home, okay? Um, in particular, now, some areas of the Pacific are seeing growing numbers of fast food restaurants. So Fiji is seeing a growing number of fast food restaurants. But other areas of the Pacific continue to see things like roadside food stalls. All right, Here in Micronesia, that's a staple to be able to stop uh, almost on any block of any street, and you can pick up things like rice and ramen and turkey tail and fried foods and so on and so forth. So when we talk about increased frequency of meals eaten away from home, we're not just talking about Pizza Hut and KFC and McDonald's and so forth. We're just talking about um, stopping at roadside food stalls or uh, stopping at restaurants and so on and so forth. And so even though the uh, 
even though the uh, illustrations in the graph there are particularly targeting uh, the mainland United States, we also have data that shows that more and more people are eating outside of home. Anecdotally, uh, here in Pompeii, which is where I happen to be working at the moment, uh, there are numerous roadside food stalls, okay, and uh, they do a brisk enough business that if you don't stop to get your rice or your ramen or whatever it happens to be by about 1.30, 32 o'clock in the afternoon, then the selection of food is almost gone. Or even in other instances, so you can go to a grocery store here on Pompeii and uh, there are pre-made sandwiches, there's pre-made Spam Musabi available and so on and so forth that you can pick up for relatively cheap. Okay, But just in terms of a quick uh, discussion of some of the percentages, we know that the percentage of the food budget spent on away from home food has actually increased steadily on the, in the United States since the 1970s and this this is actually a trend that's projected to continue and, and as the economic development here in the Pacific continues to mirror the United States and other developed countries countries, then uh, we can also anticipate that that rate will continue here as well. Now, approximately one-third of the daily caloric intake in the United States actually comes from foods that have been consumed away from home. And of course, uh, we have some studies that suggest that consuming quick surface food is also associated with increased caloric intake as well as the increased weight, stat weight status, risk of obesity, and so on and so forth. Okay. And it's actually estimated that uh, children eat almost twice as many calories in a restaurant meal as compared to eating a meal at home. So when a child eats out, whether it's a roadside food stall or an actual uh, restaurant, they tend to consume about 770 calories in a meal uh, versus about 420 calories if they actually consume that at home. Now, in addition to dietary behaviors of individuals, it's we got to look at the food environment as well. And the food environment in most areas of the world has grown to encourage higher caloric intake. Uh, convenience has become a way of life for a lot of individuals and families. And there's been a dramatic rise in the consumption of foods eaten away from home, which uh, tends to contribute to the rising obesity epidemic that we're seeing in three different ways. Okay, so we're seeing an increased number of uh, fast food establishments. Um, here in the Pacific, like I mentioned already, that is a trend that we're seeing. Um, it doesn't have to be just McDonald's to be considered fast food. It's any type of an outlet that you can stop at, whether it's these roadside stalls or whether it's uh, you know a place that you walk into. Any place that you can go in and pick up a large amount of food for readily cheap is considered fast food. So that's one uh, one way. The other way is it's the availability of large portion sizes when dining out. So if I go to fast food here in Pompeii, for example, I stop at the side of the road. I can pick up turkey tail, uh, usually two to three pieces of turkey tail for about two dollars, and I can get a really, really, really large order of rice to go with that for about a dollar. Okay, many, many more calories than I should be consuming in a single meal, and calories that are primarily coming from uh, uh, carbohydrates as well as processed. Processed fat, or not processed, but as fats uh, from the uh, turkey tail. Okay. So we have an increased number of fast food establishments. We have an availability of larger portion sizes when we dine out. And we have a tendency to select more calor calorically dense, uh, nutrient-poor foods when we dine out. And I even see this in my own life. So when I travel with some of my colleagues here from COMFSM uh, throughout the region, uh, we'll go into a restaurant and, and we we do have a number of places that actually offer all-you-can-eat buffets, and you plop down your $9, and you kind of feel like, well, I'm, I'm going to get my money's worth, and so you eat and eat and eat, and what are you eating? Once again, you're eating calorically dense, nutrient-poor foods. You're not selecting the uh, you're not selecting the salads, you're selecting the fried chicken and, and the spam musabi and things like that. Now, the other thing I want to mention, kind of bringing us back to this policy systems and environment approach, and for those of you who've been in my lectures before in the past, whether in person or here online, you know that I like to talk about, well, what's present in a community that gives people access to healthy foods? And we know that people with better access to supermarkets and um, other retail outlets that provide healthful foods tend to have healthier diets, including higher intakes of fruits and vegetables. Now, research suggests that residents of rural, minority, and lower income 
income neighborhoods are more likely to have poor access to supermarkets. Okay, And that's true outside of some of the larger cities in most of the Pacific Island countries. What you're going to find is you're going to find a village store. And you already know what is the village store going to sell. It's going to sell spam. It's going to sell tuna. It's going to sell uh, you know, a black label luncheon meat. And uh, it's going to sell... Um, a variety of different canned foods, okay, that are not necessarily good for your diet, but there's going to be a low number of access to fresh fruits and vegetables in a lot of these places as well. So um, access to more healthful foods can be improved. How can it be improved? Well, it can be improved by building and attracting um, new shopping outlets, uh, new shopping sources to communities, improving transportation um, in islands so that people can get access to uh, stores that have fruits and vegetables, and increasing the availability of affordable fruits and vegetables at existing stores, uh, including corner stores, village stores, and so on and so forth. And that's something that government simply has to invest in, all right? If government will invest in um, helping communities develop uh, uh, for-profit gardens and places to sell the produce from these gardens, um, we have really good research that suggests people will grow fruits and vegetables and they will sell them in their local neighborhoods and people will actually buy these. Because if you think about it, really from a, a lot of times from a health education standpoint, a good percentage of the population understands they should be consuming more fruits and vegetables, but a lot of times it simply is access to and affordability of these fruits and vegetables. I do want to mention really quick, um, food marketing to children as well as to adolescents is big business. Okay, um, It's not necessarily a problem on some of our smaller islands, but in our larger islands, uh, food marketing directly to children is a big deal. All right, Not only in grocery stores, but also in restaurants. All right, um, The Federal Trade Commission in the United States actually estimates that in 2006, food, beverage, and quick service restaurant companies spent more than $1.6 billion to promote their products to young people. All right. Um, children and adolescents really are an important demographic for markets for several reasons. One being that they're, cons they're customers themselves. Uh, kids increasingly have access to a disposable income. Um, they influence purchases made by parents and caregivers and that they are the future adults of the market. So if we get them hooked on certain levels of consumption of uh, types of food now, then they will consume those when they become adult consumers as well. Okay. Once again, the food and the uh, beverage marketing to children may not be such a large issue on many of our less developed uh, islands, but if you take a place like Fiji, all right, or if you take a, a well, a Fiji would be a wonderful example because Fiji is really undergoing a similar ec epidemiological transition like the United States, and we do have McDonald's, and McDonald's has Happy Meals, and McDonald's runs promotions and advertisements that try to attract children with toys and so on and so forth to come in. And even I have to admit uh, the failure of myself because sometimes it's easier to go into McDonald's and buy the kids a Happy Meal, and they get a nice little toy to go with it. Well, that's all the things that the fast food marketers want us to do for our children. And it is something that as the rest of the Pacific uh, continues to grow economically, it'll be a problem there as well. Now, extensive research has shown us that regular physical activity is important for preventing and treating obesity as well as other chronic diseases. And once again, that's things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mellitus, breast cancer, colon cancer, and so on and so forth. Okay, um, It's also, you know, we do have some of the forgotten in the CDs, and I do talk about them briefly in another presentation, but think about some of the disabling conditions like osteoporosis and arthritis that are also associated uh, with lack of physical activity. Okay? And there are risk factors also associated for other chronic diseases, especially things like um, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, and so on and so forth. Now what do we know? We also know that the health benefits from regular physical activity occur for children and adolescents, young and middle school aged adults as well as um, adults and older adults, and so on and so forth in those populations in which we have actually done studies. Now, if we were to look at the 2008 um, Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans, it recommended that children and adolescents participate in 60 minutes or more of physical activity every day. 
All right. So to obtain substantial health benefits, adults are recommended to accumulate at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity per week or an equivalent combination of the two. All right. We know that people simply are not getting that, as you can see from the, the uh, statistics there. All right. 35.5% of adults do not engage in the recommended levels of physical activity to uh, receive the necessary health benefits. Okay. And uh, in particular, uh, you look at the uh, the lower statistic there. Only 30.3% of high school students, grade 9 to 12, have daily physical um, exercise requirements. So for those of you involved in public health out there, I want you to ask yourself, in my, in my jurisdiction, in my nation state, in my community, wherever it is I happen to serve, what are the requirements for uh, PE in my school system? Is it something that kids are being physically required to get? Because in one of the other presentations that I'll do, for you. We talk about a meta-analysis looking at obesity prevention in kids, and one of the uh, target areas that we want to focus on is ensuring that kids are getting physical activity at school. So here we see an example of how transportation patterns have changed in the United States over time, and what it illustrates is our increased uh, dependence upon the automobile. Okay, Now, what you'll find, though, is that if you come out here into the Pacific, and once again, you live out here, you know this, we're increasingly importing automobiles. Okay, um, The number of automobiles coming into some of the smaller island nations is just staggering out here, and a lot of them are being imported secondhand from places like Japan, for example. And they're to the point that they're affordable to the average member of the population. And so more and more people have automobiles out here, and so what do we see? The dependence upon walk walking and the dependence upon uh, bus uh, and public transit systems, where those are available, and they're not available in all of our Pacific Island jurisdictions, is actually going down. And of course, um, if you were to look like uh, at an island nation such as Tonga, for example, and once again, not trying to pick on Tonga because I know I have many good friends from Tonga, but we know that there is an island in which uh, has some of the highest rates of obesity in the uh, Pacific and indeed in the world. And one of the factors that we've associated with the obesity is that it's a remittance economy. So there are lots of Tongans working overseas in California and New Zealand, and they're sending money back to Tonga. And what are the people that are getting the money doing? Well, they're... Um, they're buying automobiles with it, and they're using their automobiles to drive to the store and to buy a canned tuna, a canned mackerel, a canned beef, and so on and so forth, because that's actually becoming a prestige symbol to say, I eat canned as opposed to fresh. That means I have more money than uh, my neighbor who has to go down to the lagoon and catch fish. All right, so we're seeing this remittance economy in which our... Um, our reliance upon uh, vehicles and our reliance upon canned foods and so on and so forth is going up. So how do we bring this back around to that policy systems and environment approach I keep, talk keep talking about? you got to remember that policies that support physical activity through um, how we design the areas in which we live, for example, um, how do we use land specifically, or how do we develop non-motorized travel options are all going to be environmental uh, solutions that we can look to to increase physical activity. Just as an example to kind of illustrate this uh, remittance economy, I was recently working on one of the very smaller islands here in the Pacific, and I won't mention uh, which one, but the hotel I was staying at happened to also have the Western Union office there. And the gentleman I was traveling with, uh, we were getting ready to go out and to do one of these continuous professional development lectures. And I said to him, I said, why are all these people at the hotel? It's a small hotel, and we kind of know everybody who's staying here because we've been here for the weekend. And he says, oh, they're all here for the Western Union office. People are sending the money back from overseas. And I said, wow, does that happen a lot? And he said, it's very common here. And he goes, and what they'll do is they'll go to the store, and he goes, they'll stock up once again on spam and white rice and things like that. And he goes, a lot of times they'll hold a giant meal because, you know, here in the Pacific, we're very close to our family, our friends, and our neighbors, and our community, and we do use food as a social custom. We use it as a form of celebration. That's one of the many great things about the Pacific, is how close we are, and that we do like to celebrate. But he said, unfortunately, what they'll do is they'll go, and they'll, they'll prepare a giant meal, and they'll overindulge. All right, and he goes, and then what they'll have to do is they'll have to rely on uh, ramen and carbohydrates like white rice to make it through to the next week when they'll receive a little bit more of their remittance money from relatives and friends who are living overseas.
Now I want to introduce this concept of what is called place matters. In other words, the physical environment affects the daily choices we make, which in turn affects our health, and then in turn affects the uh, weight that we have. All right. So, for example, children who live in uh, neighborhoods in which they don't have, uh, they don't have parks, and they don't have uh, nice areas along the side of the road where they can ride bicycles or where to where they can walk to a school, or they don't have a playground and things like that. Okay, may be restricted to doing things like watching television indoors after school instead to playing outside. Now, families living in neighborhoods that are zoned exclusively for residential use, and zoning isn't necessarily a huge problem here in the Pacific, but I want to bring it up anyway. But these families that are living in neighborhoods that are zoned exclusively um, residential usually have to drive to work and school because it's simply too far for them to walk, okay? Now, communities, and we've mentioned this already briefly, but I'll say it again, communities that lack full-service grocery stores, uh, neighborhood food markets, that's a huge one here in the Pacific. Do our villages have access to a food market that has fresh fruits and vegetables, that has ro-ro, that has coconut and things like that? Um, well, when people live in communities that lack those, they have lack less access to these things, and consequently we do see higher rates of obesity and diabetes in those areas as well. So it's really, really important to develop community environments that foster and support healthy lifestyle choices. So here's just a couple of those that I mentioned already, all right? So um, we want to provide better access to transportation, but we want to make sure that it's transportation that is high quality. So in Fiji, we have access uh, to a large bus system, but the problem is the bus system is not well regulated in terms of carbon emissions, and so it's actually contributing uh, negatively to the environment in which we live there with air pollution. And you know, air pollution is then associated with asthma, COPD, heart disease, and so on and so forth. And like I said, access to safe places to play and to be active, all right? Access to the public transportation again, and so on and so forth. And then we also want what we call mixed use and uh, transit-oriented developments, and that's not necessarily a big uh, issue here in the Pacific, but it could be in uh, future years as we develop. Okay, so we've talked about a quick overview of the obesity epidemic. All right, we watched those slides. We gave some statistics. Uh, we talked about how obesity uh, here in the Pacific, where the tragically we have the highest rates of obesity and chronic disease in the world. We talked about increased consumption of food away from home, increased consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. Okay, uh, now let's talk about this concept of why should local government care? You are the public health practitioners. Okay? You are the ones that need to become advocates with local government. You're the ones that need to help local government understand that you can't do it alone by simply producing um, trifold brochures and going out and uh, talking to school children, that you need government on your side to actually create healthy communities, communities in which people can be physically active and get access to quality foods, okay? And a lot of that goes into economic development. And in fact, I want to point something out. Um, that was told to me at a, a recent meeting that I attended in Hawaii, and they were talking about public health, and the lady, this is actually the executive uh, director of the Pacific Island Health Officers Association, her name is Amy, and she's a wonderful woman, and she says to me, she goes, well, you know, Brian, here in the Pacific, public health is about development. And she's so right. It's about how do we develop healthy economic communities, how do we develop healthy physical communities, and how do we develop healthy psychological communities. And if we don't develop along those frameworks, we can scream to high heaven all day about how people need to eat less and move more. They simply can't do it without adequate development. And I hope that's one of the take-home messages that you get from this, is that you need to become advocates for that policy systems and environment approach. All right, so why should local governments care? Well, let me tell you, it's an economic question, all right? As we know, government is always trying to do more with less. And in fact, that's your job in public health, isn't it? You're increasingly getting new responsibilities, but you're not always getting the next, uh, uh, you're not always getting more money. And in fact, sometimes public health agencies are seeing their economic support cut, okay? So one of the things that we can do in terms of advocating for a policy systems and environment approach is, 
is we can show local government how much money this is costing. Now, I recently taught a course up in Saipan, and this is one of the things that we talked about is how can we show the economic impact of not spending on public health? Well, it can be difficult, especially at the local level, but it's something that can be done. Let's just give a few stats here. So in 2008, the annual health cost of obesity in the United States was estimated to be as high as $147 billion a year, double what we saw in the last decade. Now, annual medical expenses for the obese are estimated to be 42% higher than for a person of a healthy weight. And what do we have here in the Pacific that you're all familiar with? The term medical referral. We don't have cardiologists. We don't have um, interventional radiologists to uh, treat stroke and things like that. And so what do we do? Well, we have to send the worst of the worst cases to um, India to the Philippines, uh, sometimes even to Guam, which is one of the more developed of the Pacific Island nations. Okay, But in so doing that, that's economically draining resources out of the system. All right, Somehow we need to convince the uh, policymakers, the people that make the decisions, that if we could put money into more prevention, it's actually going to save dollars in the long run. I do want to mention um, workplace obesity programs can actually be very, very effective. We have some great evidence that shows that if uh, local government uh, will partner with uh, uh, large employers in the community to develop obesity prevention programs, that we can actually lower health care costs, we can increase worker productivity, and thereby we can increase employee productivity, which leads to higher profits. All right, We need to convince employers that um, healthy, happy employees are productive employees, and that's good for everyone's bottom line there. And CDC has some great online resources that look at workplace obesity prevention programs, and they're not complex. All right, so go and check those out as well. Um, I do want to mention in terms of resources that at the end of the uh, presentation, there's a whole set of slides with some um, online uh, web addresses that you can go out and look at. All right, so kind of coming back to this policy systems environment approach, local government officials and community leaders can enact policies that support healthy community design. And we've talked about this already. Um, parks and open spaces, mixed-use development, healthy food retailers and farmers markets, um, parks and open spaces. The two that are probably most important here are how can we work together to get healthy food retailers and farmers markets available to uh, the communities that we serve, and how can we get access to open spaces where people can engage in recreational activities. Very important here in the Pacific. And of course, local government can be part of the solution. They can impact uh, the health and well-being of the uh, populations they serve. So we have to look at who are the uh, stakeholders in local government, who are at the city, uh, uh, at the county commissioners, the uh, city councils that make decisions on zoning. Um, what is the school district doing? All right, there's some, some wonderful programs that were developed in low-income communities in California and also in some other developing areas of the world where they worked with local schools to make school facilities available after school hours, such as gyms, all right, uh, playgrounds and so on and so forth where kids could go and be physically active. What do we do in terms of transportation planning, all right? As our Pacific Island countries grow, we have to consider questions such as will we have access to public transportation? How will the public transportation work? Will it be clean? public transportation and how will it be integrated into the environments and of course parks and recreation departments to look at um, land use now most of your pacific island countries don't have a parks and rec department but they do have some type of planning commission some type of planning department that looks at local use of lands and uh, making those lands available to communities for basketball courts for soccer fields rugby pitches whatever it happens to be So when we approach it from this policy systems environment approach, we get uh, decreased uh, economic costs in terms of uh, uh, the direct impacts of chronic diseases, but we also have a couple of other changes that we see. Okay, uh, Potential for systemic changes in a community's food and physical activity environment. We can make a transition so that people are eating locally grown, locally sourced foods that are not only cheaper, but provide an economic livelihood for local farmers and bring healthier food 
food choices to local communities. Okay, The second one's particularly important because even here in the Pacific, we don't always have a level playing field. People that live in urban areas, and as we look at urbanization globally, and especially here in the Pacific, as people move from rural to urban areas, one of the reasons that they move from the rural areas is they're looking for better economic, educational, and healthcare opportunities. Okay, So we don't have a level playing field between the people that are coming to urban areas, even though there are negative health consequences associated with urban areas that I've talked about in other lectures, but they do get increased access to education and economic opportunities, which the rural communities are sometimes left out of. Well, if we address through the policy systems and environment approach, we can actually level that playing field. We can give rural populations access to the same opportunities in terms of their environment, uh, better access to economic opportunities, better access to food resources and physical um, activity resources that we sometimes see in our more urban areas. Okay. And then we also uh, recognize that we need flexibility. We want to consider the unique characteristics and needs of our community and implement obesity prevention initiatives that will specifically address those needs. So we've got to be very cognizant of the communities that we're serving. So you've heard me talk about all of these policy-based interventions and the policy systems and environment approach to public health. Well, we know that policy-based interventions are very effective. Let me just give you an example of the efficacy of this when we look at tobacco control legislation. Now, New York City went a whole decade, uh, you know, doing basically public health programs that were involved in health education where they tried to uh, deal with individual responsibility, educating people about the risks of tobacco use, um, showing those frightening pictures of a, a pig's lungs that had smoked tobacco and they're black, and what they found was, well, it just didn't work. All right. Uh, in fact, in an area like New York City, they continued to see um, smoking rates were increasing. So what they did is they said, well, we're tired of this. So they implemented a five-point tobacco control program, which is specifically uh, two of the five elements were policy initiatives. Okay, They aggressively increased the cigarette tax, and uh, they passed smoke-free air legislation in public places, uh, schools, subways, um, government office buildings, healthcare facilities, and so on and so forth. Now remember, they'd had a decade in which they'd actually seen an increase in smoking rates. But after they implemented these policy changes, what they saw, and you can see it there, is that during 2002 to 2004, estimated adult smoking prevalence decreased from 21.5% to 18.4%. 18 and what that represented was nearly 2,000 fewer smokers in New York City alone. All right, that's 2,000 fewer people that are subject subject to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, increased respiratory disease during the winter months, and possibility of cancer as well. Okay, So policy-based interventions can be very effective. Here in the Pacific, um, but we're actually working on this in a lot of different places. So, for example, Koshrai, which is part of the Federated States of Micronesia, I believe, has increased the cigarette tax. All right, And Koshrai is one of the few places I know of in the USAPI that has actually banned the importation of electronic cigarettes. Now, I do want to mention a, an important fact in terms of legislation. Uh, legislative policies that look at tobacco need to be inclusive. So, for example, in uh, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, uh, Majuro, what they did was they passed legislation that said uh, they would increase the ban on, or they would increase the uh, tax on uh, cigarettes, all right? But they didn't necessarily increase the uh, tax on cigarettes that were being brought in from outside. And so all of the sudden, uh, they saw an increase in foreign imported uh, cigarettes that weren't being taxed. So it's got to be an inclusive policy that um, covers all areas as well. So what we need from you as the uh, public health leaders, as uh, public health uh, uh, practitioners, is to call your local government to action. All right, so to provide them with information on what's going on, but in particular to provide them with evidence-based approaches, some of the things that we've been talking about today, to decrease uh, the risk factors for obesity that we see in our local communities. So we want them to enact policy and environmental initiatives that support healthy eating and active living. All right, I was recently in Chuuk, for example, and the Chuuk NCD Coalition held a wonderful evening in which they brought together all of the legislators and they invited Dr. Neil Palifax, who is a professor from the John A. Burns School of Medicine and talks a lot about social disparities, to come and speak. And uh, myself and uh, Dr. Paul Duck and I, 
who is the uh, Division uh, Chief for Health Sciences at the College of Micronesia FSM, were also there. And we also had the opportunity to talk. But it was a wonderful evening in which policymakers were made aware of this policy systems and environment approach that they need to take responsibility for. Okay. We can ask government to partner with a variety of local agencies to leverage resources and achieve greater impact. All right, That's that health and all policy approach that I was talking about before. We can uh, ask government to set feasible short and long-term goals to address the unique needs of our community. All right, But we've got to make sure we have data to support that. And then we also want to make sure that we can measure our community's performance and that as we see changes, we can adjust our goals. All right, and we shouldn't. Uh, we should expect government, and we should expect our public health agencies to not always be successful. And that when we're not successful, we shouldn't get sad and sulk and hang our head and go back and say, "Well, let's just go back to doing things the way we were before." But we should expect that programs need to be tested. A program that works in uh, Palau, for example, may not work in the CNMI. So it's important that we measure our community's performance based upon our own unique needs, and that we be, we be willing to uh, alter our programs if necessary. All right, so we've talked a quick overview of the obesity epidemic. We talked about how we got here. We talked about why local government should care, and in particular, we talked about that from the economic impact uh, that local government is going to see and the potential for cost savings in our communities. So now let's talk about policy and environmental change that we can use to address obesity. And we've touched on this briefly, but we're going to go a little bit more in depth now. So we want to target behaviors for change, all right? And I'm not saying when I say target behaviors for change, I want you to understand I'm not specifically just referring to individual responsibility. It's really about this policy, systems, and environment approach in which we provide people with physical, economic, and psychosocial environments in which they can be healthy, all right? In which we can meet the definition, you know, you've got that wonderful WHO definition of health that dates back to the 1940s. You remember what it says. It says it's not the absence of disease, all right? It's, uh, it's wellness, it's complete physical, psychological, and social well-being in which people have the opportunity to live their lives fully. All right. So here we have CDC focuses on six target behaviors for the prevention of obesity and other chronic diseases. And there are no surprises here. We want to increase physical activity. We want to increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables. We want to increase breastfeeding initiation, duration, and exclusivity. We're getting some new data that would suggest that children that are breastfed are less likely to be obese. We want to decrease the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages, and we want to decrease the consumption of high-energy, dense, uh, uh, high-energy, uh, dense nutrient-poor foods, which tend to be the bulk of the consumption of the diets that many of us have. And of course, we want to decrease television viewing. Now, not every Pacific Island jurisdiction is TV watching going to be a problem, but increasingly it is. As people have as urbanization increases and people have increasing uh, uh, amounts of income that they can spend on disposable items such as uh, cars, they're also spending on things like electronics and TVs and so on and so forth. So, like I said, are there any surprises here? No, there are no surprises here. But what, what I want you to remember here is that we're taking it back to the basics. Okay. We're taking it back to the things that we need people to engage in. But at the same time, we're not trying to take it back to always making it individual responsibility where we go out and we shake our finger at the community and we go, naughty, naughty, you shouldn't be eating turkey tail, you shouldn't be eating spam, you shouldn't be eating rice. We want to approach it from the standpoint of saying, what are the factors that are forcing people to eat turkey tail and rice and how can we develop interventions to address that? So here we have this lovely diagram. And this is what is called the social ecological model. Okay, And it looks at basically it's a framework all right, for how we can prevent obesity at the community, at the state level, and at the Pacific regional level based upon what we know about individuals and the social systems in which they work okay, and the ecology or the environments in which these individuals live, whether it's a large city, whether it's a village, and so on and so forth. Okay. So like I said, the social ecological model really stresses that society is composed of interconnected elements that invariably affect one another. Okay. There is a wonderful quote, and I wish I could remember who it was. I want to say it's like Walt Whitman or something like that. And he says, what you find in nature is that you tug on one string 
and invariably you find that it's connected to all of the other strings. We're connected to the larger world, okay? The obesity epidemic that we see at the local level is being impacted by large-scale economic factors, okay? And we have to recognize that in terms of the interventions that we develop. So like I said, um, this social ecological model stresses that society is composed of these interconnected elements that invariably are connected to one another and they affect one another. And the model is based on the premise that change in individual behavior comes about through a combination of social, community, organizational, interpersonal, as well as individual efforts. Okay. So then if we understand that individual behavior is impacted by these various different levels, many of which are beyond the control of the individual, okay, then we come down to this conclusion that really effective obesity prevention initiatives should address multiple levels of environmental, uh, environmental policies and environmental uh, factors that we see and should engage multiple sectors of society in order to affect social change and in order to uh, result in some type of policy positive health impact, okay? And it's for these reasons that agencies like CDC, WHO, SPC, and so on and so forth really do support population-based approaches to prevent and control uh, obesity, such as the uh, policy systems and the environmental changes that we've been talking about today, all right? And we also endorse the uh, uh, the development of these interventions in various settings, all right, at all levels of government and all levels of the uh, other sectors of the economy as well, okay? And I do hope, I'll do another presentation which deals with the comparative effectiveness of childhood obesity interventions, and it gets a lot more into this idea of multi-levels of society and how we need to engage children at each level to prevent obesity. So I do hope you'll go out and you'll look at that one as well, all right? But here you can see it laid out for you, all right? We've got individual factors, all right? Um, that could be psychosocial factors. Um, how does the individual feel about themselves? Where do they see themselves in the uh, uh, the larger picture? Genetics also plays a role and so on and so forth, okay? Then we have behavioral factors, um, home and family, school, community, work site, uh, access to health care, and so on and so forth, all have an influence. And then we get up to these idea of the sectors of influence, okay? And this is where we can have the opportunity to really become advocates for this policy systems and environment approach. So this is this idea of the health and all policies, all right? How do we impact what the food and beverage industry is doing? How do we impact what the Department of Education is doing to make sure that our children are getting an hour of physical activity every day and so on and so forth? How do we work with businesses and healthcare, uh, uh, how's, excuse me, how do we work with businesses to develop worksite wellness programs and so on and so forth, all right? We have to look at it from this idea of the individual, the behavioral, and then the, uh, the different sectors of influence in order to influence the type of food people are taking in, the amount of energy expenditure that they're taking out, okay? And if we can influence from those different levels, then we can actually prevent the onset of obesity and overweight, especially among children and adolescents, but also among adults as well. Let me give you some examples of how this works. Okay. Now, in the original lecture, there were a lot of examples, but a lot of them dealt with large cities like Los Angeles and Philadelphia, okay, which were not always necessarily going to be uh, practical for us here in the Pacific. So I tried to narrow it down to some in which we could replicate here. Okay. So I'm going to start with Somerville, Massachusetts. Okay. Somerville's goal was they wanted to increase access to affordable, healthier foods, something we would love to be able to do here in the Pacific. Because like I said, a large amount of the foods on some of the smaller islands that we um, rely upon, we're importing. We're not producing those locally. Okay, there's a wonderful report, and um, I'll try to find it and uh, make it as a reference in one of my future presentations. WHO looked at food security. Okay, so they looked at whether or not a country would be resistant to shortages in things like rice and canned uh, meats like spam. And what they found was that the um, the larger island nations, and in particular Fiji, uh, was less at risk of health, uh, health food security problems. Okay, And the reason for that was that we have a fairly well-established agricultural system in place where we produce a lot of our local uh, fruits and vegetables that, sold, that are sold in the market. Whereas some of our smaller island nations uh, that are not producing things are more at risk in terms of uh, food scarcity and uh, difficulties in food security. All right, So in many ways, Somerville 
Massachusetts was the same as us. They wanted to increase access to affordable, healthier foods. So what they did was they implemented a farmer's market that was culturally and economically appropriate for the community. All right. And what was the outcome? Well, the outcome was that they created, uh, created an incentive program for WIC and food stamp beneficiaries to uh, shop, at, shop at these local uh, markets. Now, WIC, uh, for those of you that are not working in, oh, I would guess only CNMI and Guam probably have WIC and food stamps. WIC is women, infants, and children, and it's for uh, pregnant women and women who have recently given birth can get access uh, to certain uh, food resources. And then if food stamps are um, an economic benefit that people living a certain level below the poverty line can receive to go and shop for student food items in local stores, okay? So here what they did is they said, well, not only do we want a farmer's market, but we want to make sure that our farmer's market ha can accept WIC benefits and can accept food benefits. So for Guam and CNMI, because I know I have some people listening there as well, that's something you could think about. Do you have local markets? And um, are these the markets that are selling fruits and vegetables? And can people use their WIC benefits and food stamp benefits there? I think there are quite a few, especially in CNMI where I've worked in the past. So that's very positive. Okay. What else did they find? They found instructions for vendors on how to accept the food stamps were useful. All right. So make sure that the vendors understand that this is a positive benefit to accept food stamps that will increase their economic uh, variability as well. Okay. They produced promotional materials in four different languages explaining to people that these food markets were now available. All right, and that they were available locally. All right, so in many of our more developed areas of the USAPI, we speak a lot of different languages. All right, uh, Saipan, which I've probably done the most work in. What do we have? We've got the various. Um, we've got Chamorro, uh, we've got Chinese, we've got English, we've got Russian, we've got the various different uh, Filipino dialects, uh, such as Tagalog and the local languages and so on and so forth, because of, and we've got a lot of the uh, Micronesian languages there as well, because the people coming uh, from the Micronesian countries, such as Palau and uh, FSM, also come there. So we want to make sure that uh, if we're going to try to get people access to locally produced fruits and vegetables through farmers markets, we want to make sure that we can promote it to the populations who need it most in a culturally appropriate way. So the result was they saw increase in the uh, attendance and they saw an increase in the percentage of foreign board, foreign born and low income patrons that were coming to these and the redu redemption rates of uh, WIC special supplemental nutrition vouchers actually went up at these local markets. So if we can get people access to locally produced fruits and vegetables in an accessible manner such as a local community market, okay, then we know that these individuals will come, all right? Here's another example, and this is um, particularly applicable here in the Pacific, all right? So here we had um, the city of Corning and Corning Union School District, and this was in California, and they wanted to increase community access to safe places for physical activity. So they brought they uh, developed a joint use agreement that opened up school recreational facilities after hours for use by the public. So in other words, the school gyms, the school playgrounds, and so on and so forth. And here in the Pacific, we are blessed with a lot of school all right, and a lot of times these schools have access to gyms. All right, uh, even if they don't have access to gyms, what they do is they have access to playgrounds. They have access to open spaces that people can come into and use. All right, and I'm not saying that in the Pacific we lock up the playground after hours, but we might want to look at innovative uh, approaches in which we partner with churches and other community organizations to organize basketball leagues. All right, to organize after-school physical activities in which kids can be physically engaged. I was really excited, so I'm here in Pompeii, and I was driving around the other day, and, and it's hard to shut off the public switch uh, in your brain, and so I'm driving around, and I constantly feel like I'm doing a windshield survey, and I drove past a school, and it was about 4.30 in the afternoon, and I noticed that the uh, school playground, and it, it's not like a really well-developed playground, but they've got a basketball court, they've got a little soccer pitch, and I noticed that the kids were there and they were playing and not were they just playing it was clear that someone was organizing some type of activity all right because the kids were very organized and there were groups of adults that were overseeing things okay something else that i know that goes here in pompeii is that we're blessed that we have a relatively nice tennis court okay 
And I know there are people here in the community that have volunteered to give free tennis lessons to kids. All right. Community involvement is very important, but it's important that we have access to the resources that already exist in the community, such as school playgrounds and gyms and churches and so on and so forth. All right. If we can get access to those things and we can develop some type of shared responsibility for maintenance and repair costs and so on and so forth, like they did in this example in California, then we can actually see changes in the physical activity through better environmental access and better policies that will decrease the obesity rates, particularly among children and adolescents. All right, so here we have another example uh, from New York City. They wanted to decrease the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages among children ages 6 and under. And in this particular program, they're targeting very young children. So they were looking at uh, licensed daycare facilities. So the New York City Board of Health simply, essentially said, we're going to limit the amount of sugar-sweetened beverages that can be served in licensed daycares. And so they limited the serving size of 100% fruit juice to 6 ounces per day for children of 8 months and younger. All right, When kids that particular uh, young are consuming uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, we get what might be called baby bottle rot, all right, because they're getting ready to develop teeth, all right, and as the teeth come in, um, and the name comes from, you know, when you put a child to bed with a bottle, and the child sits there and he drinks the milk, and the milk breaks down and converts to sugar and different enzymes that break down the teeth. Well, it's kind of the same thing. If you've got these kids that are just getting teeth or preparing to get teeth, then what you're going to see is that uh, consumption of large amounts of uh, even 100% fruit juice can actually cause those teeth to start to break down. What else did they did? They, uh, they said that when milk is served, children two years of age and older must receive low fat, 1% or non-fat milk, and that water must be readily available throughout the day. Now, there aren't a lot of daycare centers per se in the Pacific, but these are the types of policy changes that can be implemented in schools as well, because we have lots of schools here in the Pacific, and a lot of times the schools here in the Pacific have canteens or, oh my goodness, what's the word, uh, cafeteria. Okay, And a lot of times these cafeterias are run as outside operations uh, by an individual who's using it to make money. Well, we want to make sure that we have school policies and uh, education department policies in place that state the types of food that can be served in these canteens. All right, And then more important than that, we need to make sure that the policies are actually enforced. So for those of you who sat through my 10 Essential Public Health Functions course, remember policy enforcement is uh, one of the essential functions. So we can pass all the laws we want in the world, but if we're not enforcing the policies under those laws, then why did we go to the bother to, uh, to uh, pass those laws in the first place? So enforcement is an issue as well. All right, we're so close, you guys. So we've talked about uh, the obesity epidemic. We talked about some stats. We talked about how we got here, why government should care, money, and so on and so forth. And we've given some examples of policy and environmental changes to address obesity. So now let's talk about the CDC recommended community strategies and measurements to prevent obesity. Okay. Now there's a list. I think there's 26 of them, something along those lines. Some of them are going to be more uh, applicable to the Pacific than others based upon our uh, development status and we're not a homogenous group of islands some of them are going to be more applicable to different islands than are others but we're going to go through them all and the idea is for you which in your local jurisdiction who knows best as a public health practitioner and a public health uh, a leader to choose those interventions that would be most applicable for your community and to become an advocate for those things with government and within your own department All right, so before I put up CDC's goal for these uh, community-based strategies and measurements, I want to point out, and the original set of slides went through the methodology and so on and so forth for the study that developed these recommendations, but I want to point out that these are all evidence-based. None of these are theoretical ideas. These are things that have been tested uh, using rigorous academic approaches, epidemiological approaches, so, and they have been tested in uh, environments in the Pacific, and they've been tested in environments uh, that had little resources that were similar to the Pacific as well. So I do want to point out that these are things that are tested and true and they can be applied here in the Pacific. 
So the goal in uh, presenting these from CDC is to recommend a set of obesity prevention strategies and corresponding measurements. So it's important. Remember, one of the areas that's so oftentimes ignored in uh, public health is evaluation. All right, so we want to be able to measure our interventions to see if they work. Okay, so here we have a set of obesity prevention strategies and corresponding measurements to see if they work, or indicators, we could say, that local governments can use to do what? They can plan they can implement, and they can monitor. And these occur in terms of policy and environmental initiatives that we can use to prevent obesity in the communities that we serve. So very practical. And there's the, uh, there's an ex that's what this comes from, all right, the recommended community strategies. And that's something that you can go out and you can actually download from MMWR. And you probably know uh, MMWR is simply Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Now, before we jump into these, okay, we have to ask ourselves, because like I said, I'm, I'm putting a lot of um, uh, emphasis here as well on this idea of how do we measure the efficacy of these interventions, okay? So there's a couple of steps we need to follow first. First of all, we need a baseline assessment. All right, uh, those of you who sat through my epidemiology classes and data collection classes in the past know that I put a huge emphasis on we got to know where we start. If we don't have any idea where we're starting in terms of data, then how do we know if we're improving? All right, so we have to ask ourselves, do the policies and environmental conditions in our community currently promote active living and healthy eating? All right, uh, we can use that by looking at our, um, our local, our state, and our national NCD uh, control and prevention programs, and we can look at whether or not those policies are actually being enacted, all right, and then we can compare that against baseline statistics on rates of non-communicable disease. So that's how you would go about doing that, okay? So how do we compare to other communities of similar size, type, and population? All right, so here within the Federated States of Micronesia, we can do state-by-state -state comparisons if data Data is available. And that's, I, I don't put as much stress on that second one in part one as I do on the first part at looking at the policies and environmental conditions because sometimes we just don't have the data in which to compare ourselves to other communities. All right, so once we've got some baseline data, some information that shows us where we are uh, and where we want to go, both in terms of the epidemiological statistics as well as the policies we have in place, we want to identify our priorities for action. So in other words, ask ourselves, what aspects of our environment are in greatest need of improvement to promote the health of our citizens? Do we want greater access to food markets? Do we want greater access to programs that promote farming and environmental and economic investment in farms? that can sell locally produced fruits and vegetables? Do we want to invest in sidewalks? Do we want to invest in transportation systems and so on and so forth? And you can see that this is going to be very individualized to the specific jurisdiction in which you are working, okay? So once we've identified those uh, priorities for action and we've developed plans and putting them into place, we need to be able to measure the changes over time. So in other words, are we making progress in changing policies and environmental conditions to promote active living and healthy eating? And so what you'll notice is that the measuring changes over time really focuses on the policies and the environmental conditions. And so it's a policy uh, a level analysis that essentially in public health we might call this a process analysis okay it is not necessarily an impact analysis so we're not necessarily looking at did we decrease the number of individuals being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes did we decrease the number of individuals presenting to the um, emergency department uh, with myocardial infarcts okay here we're looking at a process analysis to determine whether or not the interventions have actually changed the policies the systems that are in place and have impacted in the environment in which people live. So that's an important differentiation that I want you to keep in mind there. So like I said, the outcome of all of this, and I didn't take you through the whole process by which CDC came up with these 24 recommendations, was to make the recommendations and then also to make suggested measurements for each strategy that you and your individual communities can use. So let's go ahead and let's talk about the various interventions. I'm oh, sorry, I jumped ahead there. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to go through the graphics to get back to the previous slide. Hold on. Somebody at CDC had fun putting that one together. There we go. Okay. 
And so what you're going to see as we go through these is they're broke. These 24 uh, ideas is that they're broken down into um, different sections, okay, different uh, subtopics. So the first one we're going to talk about are these six strategies to promote the availability of affordable healthy foods and beverages. All right, so increase availability of healthier foods and beverage choices in public service menus, okay. So this could be uh, the restaurants. All right, so do we want to make sure that our restaurants actually serve healthy options on the menu, or is it all going to be fried chicken and uh, white rice? Okay, improve availability of affordable, healthier foods and beverage choices in. Uh, uh, Okay, affordable. Okay, so the first one is healthier, the second one is affordable. Okay, we want to make sure that foods are actually affordable to the populations that we serve. Okay, because a lot of times I think under the uh, current economic conditions we see in the Pacific, sometimes it's it's cheaper to eat turkey tail and rice than it is to buy uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and go along those lines. We want to make sure that the communities, uh, it would be a good idea, go out and map the geographic availability of supermarkets, particularly those in the rural and the outlying areas, and determine what's available in those supermarkets so that we can improve availability in, of foods in those places. Okay, We want to improve availability of mechanisms for purchasing foods from local farms. Okay, I'll give an example of that. Okay, um, I was recent, recently in Koshirai, and I met with some business leaders there, and what I learned was that every Every day, these local grocery stores sell out of the locally produced fresh fruits and vegetables that they have, but they don't sell out of the imported ones. Well, why is that? Well, the answer is simple. It's not only is it just availability, okay, in terms of how much they have access to, but it's pricing. Locally produced fruits and vegetables tend to be less expensive than those that have been brought in from overseas, okay? And we also want to provide incentives for the production, distribution, and procurement of foods from local markets. And I can turn to Fiji as a wonderful example of this. We have the largest um, market in the Pacific, okay, in Suva. And it's this huge sprawling area in which you can go in and you buy, there are imported foods, in particular apples and oranges that come from California and New Zealand and so on and so forth, but it's by and large, it's locally produced foods and it's seasonal, all right? So there's a time of year in which you get tomatoes, there's a time of year in which you get pineapple, watermelon, and so on and so forth, and they're relatively inexpensive because they have been locally produced. We also want to develop strategies to support healthy food and beverage choices. So can we restrict availability of less healthy foods and beverages in public service menus? All right, so what policies can we develop that restrict whether or not we can simply walk into any store and uh, pick up the fried chicken and the white rice? Okay, can we institute smaller portion size options in public service venues? All right, so how do we go about reducing the amount of rice that's served with um, uh, uh, well, I keep pick, picking on fried chicken because that's the one I can think of that's frequently served here in Pompeii. All right, so can we decrease the amount of white rice that's being served? Okay, this uh, number nine isn't necessarily as applicable here in the Pacific, but if it is, do we limit an advertisement of less healthy foods and beverages? Okay, but to an extent that's true as well because if I go into the grocery store, what do I see advertised? Okay, I don't see apples from New Zealand advertised. I see, um, oh, the thing that comes to mind is bongos in Fiji, which are very unhealthy, uh, salty little snack, or I see Shasta, uh, the soda being advertised, all right? I don't see the healthy things being advertised, okay? And how do I go about uh, discouraging consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages? Can we prohibit um, the sale of sugar-sweetened beverages in school canteens? Can we prohibit the consumption of and sale of sugar-sweetened beverages in workplaces? So at Fiji National University, they haven't gone so far as to say, I can't consume soda on site, but I can't buy it on site. It's no longer an option in my canteens, okay? We want strategies to encourage uh, breastfeeding as well. So we want to approach uh, the breast as best approach, okay? So we need to look at what, what environmental conditions can we uh, alter to encourage that. And that's particularly important here in the Pacific where access to things like Similac and formula and so on and so forth, that's an expensive proposition. All right, so we do want to encourage breastfeeding not only because it's best for the child's uh, uh, physical as well as cognitive development, but because it is something that we have access to locally. So strategies to encourage physical activity or limit sedentary activity among children and youth, okay? Do we require PE in schools? 
All right, ask yourself that. In some of the islands I've traveled to, they told me, no, we don't require it anymore. All right, PE is something that should be part of the educational curriculum. And if it isn't, how do we get it there? And if it is, how do we increase the amount of physical activity in our PE programs in schools? Okay, I've mentioned this quite a bit already. How do we increase opportunities for extracurricular physical activity? So my kids go to a school in Fiji in which we were concerned about this, and the school implemented clubs and so on. Friday afternoon, what they do is they have clubs, and the clubs are things like rugby, swimming, uh, football, and so on and so forth, all right, all of which give kids something physically active to do, all right, but it also has the social benefits of keeping kids out of trouble if they have some place to go. All right, and can we reduce screen time in public service venues as well? So in other words, when we're, well, airports would be a wonderful example of this. Think about sitting in an airport. There's always a TV um, blasting, you know, CNN or Al Jazeera or something like that. Or when we're sitting uh, in a government office, do we sit and we watch TV? Or when we're sitting in a restaurant, do we sit and watch TV and so on and so forth, Okay. All right, so CDC also recommended strategies to create safe communities that support physical environment. So how do we improve access to outdoor recreational facilities? I'm not talking about you know, gyms and things here. I'm not talking about million dollar playgrounds. Like I said, here in, in the Pacific Islands, I see that if there's an empty lot available, kids will take an old bucket and they'll nail it to a tree, knock the bottom out of the bucket, and they play basketball. All right. Can we find a way so that every community has access to fresh fruits and vegetables, a small local store with affordable options, and access to some type of physical environment in which kids can be, and adults can be physically active? Um, can we increase infrastructure to support bicycling and walking? All right. Um, bicycling isn't huge here in the Pacific, but walking is. Lots of people still walk. And on those occasions when I visit other countries and I don't rent a car, for example, or when I'm new to a place and I haven't bought a car yet and I have to walk, one thing I notice is that a lot of the places that I've lived here in the Pacific are not walking friendly. So every day when I drive out to uh, uh, the College of Micronesia FSM campus where my office happens to be right now, the roads are just full of kids and there are no sidewalks and that's the major thoroughfare for people going out to the government offices because it's the main road out to government which employs a lot of people and so a lot of people are walking on these roads trying to get to school at the same time that cars are, are rapidly passing by. So it doesn't encourage physical activity other than the required physical activity if I have to walk along these streets to get to schools. Okay, Number 19 isn't particularly applicable here. Our schools are where they are, and oftentimes they are in our residential neighborhoods. A lot of places in the United States, uh, schools are zoned so that they can't be in residential neighborhoods. That's not so much a problem here, but the problem here in the Pacific is, can we get access to the recreational facilities available in these schools through these mixed um, use development programs? Can we improve access to transportation so that people don't have to rely so much on vehicles? Okay, Not always is going to be an issue in all of our Pacific Island countries, but as we develop economically, it will become an issue. And we need to also stress not just improved access to transportation, but improved access to clean and safe transportation. Um, zoning for mixed-use development, not necessarily a problem here in the Pacific. Enhanced personal safety where people are or could be physically active. That goes back to what I'm talking about, the school children walking down the road in the mornings. And I see very young kids. All right, The Pacific is a safe place. Our kids can go out and they can walk to school at a very young age, and we don't have to worry about stranger danger per se, but we do have to worry about automobile safety, okay? And how can we enhance traffic safety in areas where persons are or could be physically active? Once again, that goes back to the idea of me, you know, that I was talking about earlier. When I walk to the grocery store, when I walk to uh, the local market, whatever it happens to be, are there sidewalks in which I can safely choose to walk as opposed to getting in my car and driving? I was recently at the Hawaii Public Health Association. One of the things they talked about was how they were trying to redesign Honolulu to be safe for bicyclists and pedestrians because they actually have a rather, they have a large percentage of the population that walks. Uh, and of that percentage of the population that walks, a significant number of those individuals are older. And so they actually have a high number of mot uh, motor, motor vehicle versus pedestrian accidents. And that's something that they're trying to address. Okay.
And finally, number 24, um, strategies to encourage communities to organize for change. So in other words, and once again, you've heard me say this before, if you've been in any of my other classes, when we say, are you developing relationships with the community and community stakeholders, we mean it. It isn't just a box to check on the grant application. It's truly, if you go out and you work directly and you engage the communities, the communities will oftentimes have solutions you didn't know about because you don't live in that community. But you've got to find a way to get access to that community through focus groups, through panel discussions, through finding key community stakeholders so that then you can actually have an influence in that community. Communities that you partner with are much more likely to engage in the interventions that you you uh, develop in partnership with them than if you just simply come in and say, I am the public health leader and I know everything. If you just come in like that, community isn't going to listen. But if you come in and you engage them, community not only will listen to you, but you have an opportunity to listen to the community as well. All right, so here's some resources for implementing strategies and measuring uh, and monitoring performance. So the first one is that uh, a link to that uh, uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report from which these all came from. And you can see there's a couple more there, such as uh, a detailed implementation and measurement guide is also available from CDC. And then, of course, we just have pages of references here in case you want to go out and learn a little bit more. So what does it come down to? Well, it comes down to this idea that if we're going to reverse the obesity epidemic here in the Pacific, we've got to have shared responsibility. All right, We've got to, as public health leaders and as public health practitioners, we've got to find a way to put the emphasis back on government. We need their help in terms of uh, planning these policies, systems, and environmental change because we can't make the zoning changes. We can't necessarily get access to the schools. We can't build sidewalks. We can't build basketball courts, but government can. Okay, and I want to stress something, and I try to stress this in all of my public or all of my presentations, is that the Pacific is full of strong, healthy, proud people. That's what we have. We have a strong, healthy, proud past. But unfortunately, if the obesity epidemic and the NCD epidemic continues the way it's going, we aren't going to be able to retain that strong heritage. We're going to die younger. We're going to die sooner. We're going to have greater disability, and we'll lose that strong history. Okay. So it's up to you. All right. It's the public health practitioners and leaders of today and tomorrow to help advocate for the policies, systems, and environmental changes that we need to make the public health revolution a reality. As always, thank you so much for listening. I know it's not always enjoyable to listen to a disembodied voice, but hopefully maybe one of these days I'll get to meet each and every one of you in person. Please do um, make sure you listen to some of my other presentations, especially the one on economic and nutritional shifting, and then there's going to be another one dealing with um, child childhood obesity prevention uh, from a policy systems and environment approach as well. Thank you.